Take your Bibles, if you would, and turn to Acts chapter 12. Acts chapter 12. We're going to look at a few passages of scriptures here in Acts chapter, beginning with chapter 12. We'll bounce a couple chapters over uh, as, as we go. Uh, Acts chapter 12. Uh, I want to introduce you to the subject matter of last week, or the intended subject matter. I don't think I ever got to that point in the discussion. But I think this will help you. Honestly, I, 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 and I'm, I'm just touching what last week I kind of laid out. This is going back, and the and, and Lord just wants me to focus on, uh, especially Sunday morning, on what our banner says, We the People. Um, certainly, uh, that brings back the, the mindset of our, our founding uh, document. Certainly, uh, the, the founding fathers de de determined that each individual uh, had unalienable rights and had, uh, had guarantees given to them by God. And, and I think God gave them those three words, we the people, in, in order to tell them and tell us and tell the world that we're all important. But I think that came from God, and therefore I think it's apropos to us using it in uh, this church setting, because I honestly believe that everyone is important to God. So important they are to God that he sent his only begotten son to die for them. And God doesn't want anyone rejected. Unfortunately, many times in our churches, our church uh, setup, our church operation, um, we uh, unfortunately give the impression that somebody doesn't meet our standards or doesn't come up to where we want them so they can't come to our church. I do not want Heartland Baptist Church to be that. Uh, Heartland Baptist Church ought to be the church where everyone feels welcome. I don't care what status you are in life. I don't care your monetary value. Uh, I, I don't care uh, how you carry yourself. I, I don't care politically where you're at. I don't care uh, how you function and operate. Jesus died on the cross for you. So his church, we, his church, ought to be gracious enough to reach out uh, to all with the gospel of Christ. But not only that, with open arms willing to accept everyone into our little family here. Uh, and we've, we've done that. I, I've had some people that, uh, talk to me. An evangelist told me, you have an eclectic group. And what that means is a bunch of different uh, people in the church house from different walks of life. And somehow we meld together. Now, because we're an eclectic group, sometimes we meld together and there's bumps along the way. Uh, you, 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 you operate a church like this, you'll get a guy like Steve Lanham here that might say something and you just love him. I mean, what else can you do with him? You'll, you'll get, uh, uh, you'll get people in and, and to, to be honest, that's what I love about our church. We're just people. Uh, I pick on him cause he's, he's vocal and he don't mind me picking on him. Some of you guys are quiet and mean. Uh, he's vocal and mean, but uh, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> he's not mean at all, but uh, I just want us to get to a point, and I think God has given me a, a, a view, at least uh, for a few weeks. I'm going to pick out characters in the Bible that many would just throw out. Many would say, this this one's no good. Uh, this one, and, and I heard it a lot when I was a kid, not, not as much as I've gotten older, but certainly in the church, I've heard this term, bad seed. Uh, because your mom and your dad were, were bad or did bad things, then you're, you're going to be bad. That isn't biblical at all. That's not God's intent. God made each individual person. Uh, and each individual person has an individual free will internally inside of them. Each individual can choose to do right or choose to do wrong. Uh, yes, it's true, our environment has a, a part to play in that, but we all are in control of ourselves. And when we get to a point where we give that free will to Christ, God will direct us in ways we never would have dreamt for ourselves. And ultimately, I, I hope we see that as we go through talking about these various in individuals in the Bible. Acts chapter 12, look down at verse number 25, I want to introduce you to the character uh, that we're going to talk about. And Barnabas and Saul returned from, the Jeru uh, from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry. In other words, they had gone on their missionary trip. They took with them John, whose surname 
was Mark. I want to introduce you to a character, Mark, or John Mark. His first name was John. Uh, his nickname or surname would have been Mark, much like uh, me. Uh, my given name is Alan Edward Ray. Uh, I was born with that name. I'm the third in the lineage. My grandpa had a name, Alan Edward Ray. Dad, Alan E. Ray Jr., Alan Edward Ray Jr. I'm Alan Edward Ray, technically the third, but was never attached to my name. So uh, it was a little disheartening because I've grown up, my name's Alan uh, E. Ray, Alan Edward Ray. Then when grandpa passed some years back, I went to his funeral. It's kind of unnerving when you pick up the obituary little thing they give you, and it's your name on there. Just a little bit unnerving. Uh, but, uh, but so I understand. Uh, I was given the name Dusty. Some of you are saying, how do you get the name Dusty? Because mom and dad don't like me. That's why. Uh, <coughs> they, uh, I, I, I was at birth. Dad was always called in the family Buddy. Uh, they always gave him that nickname from, uh, I think it was two or three when they gave him that nickname. All the family, if you're around the family, you'll re mom talks to, calls him buddy when she's talking to him. Uh, that's what they've always called him. They decided I would get a nickname, only I got mine early. I got mine in the hospital. Uh, I was born, and, uh, and grandma, my mother's mom, and, uh, and uh, she saw my hair was a little reddish. Yes, I did have hair. And uh, the teenagers, most of them have left, but they always say, you had hair? Yes. And, uh, but anyway, uh, and it was a little reddish. And so grandma came up with the nickname, because they were trying to come up with a nickname. We're going to, let's call him Rusty. Uh, mom didn't like that. Grandpa, or my, uh, my, my grandma and my dad both liked Rusty, but mom liked Dusty. So what that tells you is that my mother, instead of naming me after uh, oxidation, she named me after dirt. And uh, <laughs> so <laughs> I was doomed either way, you could tell. But, uh, <laughs> but I anyway, I tell folk that uh, I'm, I'm named after dust. And I think Brother Larry is the one who refers to me as fluffy dust, be fl fluffy dirt, because it's dust. But anyway, those are. And if you have a, uh, you want to make fun of my name, it's okay. Uh, it's happened all my life. Uh, I believe I'm convinced that mom and dad decided this nickname for me to keep me humble. When you're named after dirt, it's not easy to stay humble. Uh, or it is easy to stay humble, maybe I should say. Okay, Mark chapter 12, verse 25, introduces this character of John Mark. John Mark, we find a little more about him if you turn over to Acts chapter 13. If you look down to verse 13 and verse 25, we're introduced to him as he's going on a journey with his uh, with Barnabas and Silas. And as they're on the journey, the missionary journey, this happens. This event happens. Verse number 13, when Paul and the company lose from Pamphus or Paphos, they came to Ferga or Perga. I'm sorry, in uh, Pamphylia and John departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. What happens here? John goes on a missionary journey, young John, to help uh, John Mark, to help, his, uh, uh, to help Paul and Barnabas on the missionary journey. He gets down the road, not very far down the road. You can read the first uh, 13, 11, 12 verses of chapter 13. He didn't go very far with them, and then he decided this was more than he had planned for. And so he leaves, and he goes back home. Uh, he got homesick, if you want to call it that. And then, and then thumb over to chapter 15 of Acts. And look at verse 37 uh, says here in Acts chapter 15. <coughs> Start with verse 36 there. And some days after, Paul and Barnabas said, or Paul said to Barnabas, Let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word unto the Lord and see how they do. Understand Paul's perspective. He's saying, okay, Barnabas, we've gone around as missionaries. We've reached churches, started churches, encouraged churches along the way. Uh, he says, let's go back and let's be an encouragement to those peoples that we have come in contact with as we've ministered to them and encouraged them uh, on their way. Verse 37, the Bible says, and Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark. So Barnabas, half of this dynamic missionary duo, uh, makes this uh, decision. He says, Paul, let's take Mark with us. Uh, and 
And Paul thought, verse 38, not good to take, to take him with them, who departed from them from Pamphylia and went not with them to the work. You see Paul's perspective. Paul's perspective is, and you, you read the writings of Paul, Paul's a doer. He's a go-getter. Rolls up his sleeve and he goes at it. And he wants to go do the work. And he wants to go encourage these churches where he and Barnabas had gone to before. And he wants to go and be an encouragement to them. Now Barnabas, who's more of a, uh, a, a, a kinder soul, if you read about Barnabas, you'll see that Barnabas has a kind of a softer, if you want to call it that, uh, way about him. Barnabas sees this as an opportunity for this young man to maybe get it right. Uh, he had messed up the first time and ran home. Barnabas thinks he's grown up a little bit. Let's take him and give him another chance. Paul's thinking, we're going to go to be a blessing to these churches. And if we take this guy with us to the church where this guy bailed on us, what's that church going to think about us? So you can I kind of see, I think you can see both perspectives pretty clearly. That Barnabas thought we need to give this young man encouragement and help him. Paul's thinking we're out to encourage the churches. Yes, I want that young man to, to be encouraged and helped. But our objective is to reach the churches. And I think this guy will be a detraction from us if he ba fails yet again. <clears throat> and then verse, uh, the, the, the verse number 39. And the contention or... A feud, and not really feud, feud's too harsh of a term. The di dissension between, uh, tension between them, the, the argument, if you will. They, one wanted one thing and one the other, was so sharp between them that they departed asunder one from another. So Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus. And Paul chose Silas and departed, uh, being re uh, recommended by the brethren to the, uh, by, unto the grace of God. So he went through Syria to Sicily, uh, Sicilia, confirming the churches. So Paul went about the work, went back to all the churches where he had gone before. Barnabas so wanted the, to be an encouragement to Mark that Barnabas said, Paul, I appreciate what you're doing and your intent, but I think this young man needs some help. And I want to help him. I want us to help him. But if you don't want to help him, you're going to have to go your way because I'm going to try to work with him in the mission work and try to help him. So Paul and Barnabas separate ways here. The greatest uh, uh, biblical uh, team of missionaries is now separated. Uh, it's mind boggling when you think of the work that these two guys had done. In reality, Barnabas takes Paul under his wing. And, and introduces him to the disciples and, and, and helps Paul in, uh, when he was Saul of Tarsus. Before long, God blesses Paul in, in such a way, changes his name, blesses him. In such a way, you see the Bible transfers the, uh, the leadership of this group to Paul and Barnabas. And Barnabas was gracious in that. In other words, Barnabas knew he had the, the, the ability to help a young man. But when Paul found uh, the, the, when Paul started clicking and doing better, Barnabas was sensible enough to step back and say, okay, Bar Paul, you go ahead and take the lead. You got a different personality in that realm. You go with the lead and I'll just help along the way. And Barnabas was good. That rarely happens. Rarely will you have a, a, a situation where you have a, a leader that's leading a group as Barnabas was with uh, Saul of Tarsus and even Paul. And, and, and then him to step back and let Paul take that leadership role and, and, and kind of dictate what they were doing. So it was a perfect a match made in heaven, if you will. And Barnabas willingly did it and went through a second missionary journey and heading into the third and was good to do it a third, a third time with Paul and was okay with that. Uh, but, but Barnabas said, I want to help John. Kind of like I helped Saul of Tarsus, I want to help John Mark. And, and I want to help him get it right. <clears throat> and so... Paul didn't like that idea. He says, no, we got a Jew. He was a driven man and uh, a, a vision. He grabs a, a young man, Silas, and he goes off back to the churches. Barnabas gets Mark and he heads off to Cyprus. I tell you all that to tell you this. This John Mark is one of the most interesting characters in the Bible that most of us don't know much about. But John Mark was a good man. But we find out that that, uh, uh, let's see, are we, yeah, take Acts chapter 12. Come back there uh, real quick to Acts chapter 12. 
The story here that's in Acts chapter 12 is a story where Peter is put in jail uh, for preaching. When he's put in, in, in jail for preaching, then, uh, then uh, the church, if you will, gather and they start praying for his release. An angel comes by night and uh, comes into the jail cell with him, uh, 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 kicks Peter in the side, tells him to wake up. And carries him through the open gates with the sleeping guards through the story, uh, uh, the doors, and uh, to the house, and, and to this particular house. And there's a knock, Peter knocks on the door, and there's a discussion with a little girl called Rhoda, where she goes into the church. Church is all gathered at this house praying. And, uh, and while they're praying, uh, Rhoda hears a knock at the door. She runs to the door, opens it. It's Peter. The reason they're gathered praying is praying for Peter. She shuts the door, turns around, tells the people at church, Peter's at the front door. They didn't believe her, told her to go away. She had to, to plead with them to finally get their attention as Peter's beaten on the door to try to get in. And, and, and uh, finally they see that their prayers were answered and little Rhoda was trying to tell them that, but they didn't listen. Is that not so much like we are? Uh, well, Lord, please bless. Please take care of this. Please take care of this. A lot of times he's taking care of it and we're still pleading with him because we're not listening to him because we're not looking around to see uh, that he's fixed the problem. That's the story that's illustrated here in verse number 12 there uh, of, of uh, chapter, what is it? Chapter 12. Yes, chapter 12, verse th of number 12. And when he had considered Considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, uh, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark. There were many gathered together praying. In other words, <coughs> this is indicative of the young man's upbringing. The young man's upbringing, back in those days, churches were put in houses. They, weren't, they didn't have their own secluded or, or isolated church building that was just used for that function. Generally, one of the wealthier people in the house had uh, or in the church had a big house church would gather there and so what we see and we learn about this John Mark is he comes from a good family that opened the door of their uh, of their house uh, on a regular basis to allow the church to gather in their house so it teaches us two things probably this John Mark was a young man of some wealth uh, some prestige his family had some money and not only that, secondly, it teaches us that he was godly. He grew up in a godly home. So John Mark knew, knew some things. Now, I'm going to take a sidestep, if you will, uh, and, and, and talk to you with this perspective of we the people and how that God can take anybody from anywhere if they're willing. And if, if we'll not quit on God, if we'll continue to go forward for God, God will take us and make something of us. Proverbs chapter 24, verse number 16. Listen to what the Bible says. For a just man falleth seven times and riseth up again, but the wicked fall into mischief. I have a message that I preach from time to time entitled, A uh, Just Man Falleth Seven Times and Riseth Up Again. And I go through that uh, message and talking about getting back up. Uh, don't get uh, tied down. Don't fall and not get up. Uh, this, this, uh, the one thing I love about this verse here, it says, for a just man falleth. Do you know what a just mean? That word just means righteous. A righteous man falleth. Seven times. You know what that's telling me? That even though we are righteous and trying to do right, we're probably going to fall. And the Bible's teaching us here that a just man will get back up. He won't stay down and allow his uh, disappointment or his frustration or, 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 or the obstacle that he's tripped over to win. Uh, if the horse get, it bucks you off, you're supposed to get back on. Uh, or you can have my philosophy. Uh, I, I don't want to get bucked off by a horse. I don't get on him. Uh, it's much safer that way. But uh, if, if, you, if you have a wreck in a car, I remember Nettie had a wreck in a car. And, and right away, I put her in the seat, the driver's seat of the car. You say, you shouldn't have done that. She was scared. She didn't want to, Daddy, I don't want to do this. Baby, you need to drive the car. Uh, because I didn't want her petrified of driving a car. I wanted her to be able to drive a car. 
I'm not going to live forever. Her mom's not going to live forever. Someone's going to have to get her from point A to point B. She's got the ability. She needs to drive the car. Uh, some will say that's mean parenting. I think it's sensible, but uh, you can think what you want. But uh, uh, th that's the way that God's teaching us here. A just man falls. It teaches us we will fall, but it teaches us that even when we fall, get up. Uh, dust, dust your knees off and get back to work. That's what he's teaching us here. And, and the latter part of that verse says, but the wicked fall into mischief. Interesting. The wicked fall, but they don't get back up. They stay down there and get into mischief. Trouble, no good. And, and the truth is that we need to understand. I, I'm just going to read some bullet points I put here. I got a couple points at the end and then we'll be on our way. Christians make mistakes. Oftentimes due to youth and experience or ignorance or even indifference. There's a feeling of guilt and worthlessness that takes over, and we often feel that God cannot use us anymore. His name was Mary. Mark's, uh, uh, I mean, his mother's name was Mary, who was the sister of Barnabas. <coughs> Colossians 4 and verse 10 will tell you that. His mother's house was used for a prayer meeting for Peter when he was in jail. Believe that his family was in uh, some of some means uh, because the Bible says that many had gathered in their house. He was a wealthy child that grew up in church. He was well provided for and well trained. He had church in his house. You had to be well trained. Uh, I'm sure his parents worked hard to train him. He found himself in many situations, but his character failed him. John, which means Jehovah has graced. Uh, his surname or nickname uh, that he received was Mark, which means a Christian. Just by virtue of his name meant something. Uh, the, 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 the statement in Luke 12 and verse 48, unto whom much is given of him shall much be required. John, Mark, had much given to him. Boy, there was, uh, I'm sure the expectations were high for this young man. Wealthy family, didn't have to worry about funds, uh, had, had the church in his household. He was grown up in a Christian home, a Christian environment. He was going to be part of a great work of his uncle Barnabas and great apostle Paul. In Acts chapter 13, 13, we read that John Mark leaves Paul and Barnabas in the work they were doing. In other words, he was on the job and he quit. Have you ever been at a job? And somebody just walked out. Do you know what that does to those that are left behind? It puts a lurch on the whole operation. Instantaneously, the manager has to find somebody to cover that person's job. It gets chaotic. It's more stress on one or two of the employees that now have to pick up slack for the one that's left. It's a difficult thing. By this time in the trip, I'm sure that John Mark had some duties. I'm sure that he had some things, maybe if nothing else, baggage to carry. He was doing something. All of a sudden, Paul and Barnabas are about preaching the word, preaching the lost and trying to spread the gospel of Christ. Now this sidekick of theirs, this helper of theirs has just up and left him. Surely Mark must have felt like a total failure. Later, Barnabas wanted to take Mark with him and uh, he and Paul on their second miss missionary journey, but Paul refused. The rift became so great that Paul and Barnabas separated. First, he quit on God. Then he caused the split up of probably the greatest missionary duo ever. In Mark chapter 14, verses 51 and 52, a, a young man followed Jesus while he was under arrest being taken by a high priest. But the Bible says that this young man fled away naked. It's the only one of the Gospels you'll find this little story, two little verses in Mark chapter 14, uh, verses 51 and 52. Many Bible scholars believe that the young man that fled in, uh, in his, uh, he had his night blanket over him uh, and seeing all this ruckus had come out and uh, the guards went to get him and he ran away and left his blanket in their hand and ran away naked. Most likely, most theologians believe this was our very own John Mark. He probably knew Jesus to some degree. His family probably did. I have a feeling if that were the case, here now he's fled away, uh, defeated as the Savior is carried off to Calvary uh, and eventually crucified. 
Now he's caused a rift between the two that are out trying to spread the gospel of this one that he turned his back on before. Certainly he must have felt like he'll never accomplish anything. Here with verses we read, we find that he goes with Barnabas to Cyprus to do God's work. He said, uh, Paul said in uh, first, uh, 2 Timothy 4 and verse 7 that he had kept the faith. The evidence, if you will, Paul giving us credence, if you will, as the church, the evidence of somebody uh, and a Christian's success is whether or not they have stuck with the work that God has given them to do. Did they last? I've had people ask me, how long have you been at the church? When I tell them my pastor, most of them chuckle. And, uh, and then they say, well, you've probably been a pastor for a year or two, huh? No, I've been a pastor. It's getting to be a long time now. And uh, I, I've got a few years on me now. Uh, but uh, the truth is that when you look at a pastor, you see, been there, you've been there that long? Wow. Uh, that's, you, you're finally getting somewhere. Uh, the truth of the matter is, when you're talking about Christianity, uh, sometimes, a, a, and service, sometimes we focus on this fine-tuned focusing on just this incident at hand, and we don't look at the whole body of work. Because when we look at Mark in Philemon chapter 20, or Philemon 1 and verse 24, and Colossians 4 and verse 10, we we find him with Paul while he was in prison. And Mark uh, was with them uh, there in prison. And, and, and here in 2 Timothy uh, chapter 4, when Paul, if you will, is on his deathbed, we see Paul uh, referring to Mark in this fashion. Listen, uh, only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable for me to the ministry. Wait a minute. Paul, just a little while ago, a few years back, you said, this guy, uh, I'm not, if this guy's going on this trip, I'm not going. He left the work before, I'm not going with him. And it caused such a rift, you left Barnabas and went your own way. And, and how can you say that now Mark is profitable? Because Paul, in prison, ready to die, had watched the life of this young John Mark. That Barnabas had high hopes for. Uh, eventually, he started getting it right at some way, uh, somewhere along the line. And Mark became profitable. Listen, let me tell you, as a Christian, you may fail. Let me better yet tell you, as a Christian, you will fail. Many of us, when we get saved, we feel the cleanest we've ever felt in all of our lives. We just got saved and we, uh, we're, we're so excited. We go home. I was saved just a little kid. Uh, I go home. I was so excited. Mom loved me. Uh, uh, my dad loved me. My sisters were all hugging and say, praise the Lord, you got saved. The church was, uh, uh, loved me. I got baptized. Everything was good. Man, it's not good. It's just the greatest day in the world. And then the thought came into my mind, I'll never do anything wrong ever again. I went to bed. It was late at night when I got saved and all. I woke up the next morning, but something bad happened. My three sisters were still at the house. And I was stuck with three sisters and it didn't take me long before I didn't feel saved no more. There's no way God can save me. I just pulled both pigtails and ran as fast as I could so mama couldn't catch me. I'm dying and going to hell. That's all there is to it. You say, you didn't think that way. I sure did think that way. But I was saved yesterday, but not today because I messed up big time. Mom's yelling at me. Dad's yelling at me. My three sisters are trying to kill me. This is not what it's supposed to be. I got saved last night. Everything was supposed to change. It didn't happen right away, did it? And the truth of the matter is that all of us go through phases like that. Where we mess up and we fall and we fail as a Christian. But in reality, I want to be here today to remind you that you got a purpose. God made you for a purpose. And that purpose, you might slip up today, but you know what? You can get up and keep on going. You can get up and keep on doing a work for God. What made Mark, what made the difference in Mark? I mean, Mark should have just quit. I mean, good heavens. 
if it is he, the one that ran away from Jesus at night, he didn't stand up and fight to, uh, to, to protect Jesus. I know it wouldn't, have been, it wouldn't have been sensible, but we'd have thought better of Mark if he'd have done that, if he was truly that boy. Uh, and then later on, uh, 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 Paul and Barnabas fixed to go on a missionary journey, and he says, I'm done with this. I'm not going to live like that. He probably said, I'm not eating at that restaurant, and I'm leaving. Uh, he didn't like it. They didn't have restaurants back then, I don't think, not a whole lot. But... McDonald's was bad in the country they were in. I don't know. Uh, but uh, it, it, no matter what the case, uh, he left. He got up and he left the, the fight and he left the battle. And he didn't do the work that God ha had put for him to do. He walked away from that and he left. If you look in your Bibles, you'll see in Philemon chapter 1 and verse 24. I know there's only one book and I don't know if you want to take the time to look there. But Philemon... Verse number 24, the Bible says, Marcus, Aristarchus, Demas, Lucas, my fellow laborers. These are Paul's friends. He said, Philemon, these are my friends. Paul, at the verse that we mentioned just a, a, a little bit ago in, in verse 11 of chapter, 2 Timothy chapter 4. He says, only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him unto me, for he is profitable for the ministry. Uh, but the verse prior to that, he makes a statement in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 10, for Demas hath forsaken me. Well, just a second ago, we see that Demas is one of those listed as a fellow laborer of Paul. But Demas forsook uh, uh, Paul. So when Paul was on his dying day, he didn't reach out to Demas. Demas had forsaken him. But in reality, didn't Mark forsake him earlier when he was with Barnabas? Well, yeah, he did. But he didn't continue there. Mark got it right, got himself back on track, got back to the work to the degree that the guy who had fought against a, a, a good friend in Barnabas and said, I'm not going with that guy if he goes. Now, all of a sudden, he reaches out and says, uh, he's profitable. What made him profitable is the fact that John Mark got himself up cleaned himself off, got himself right, and started going forward for the Lord. And the truth is that can happen to any Christian ever, any of us. And it should happen to all of us. I'm not perfect. Neither are you. Neither was John Mark. But God chose Mark to be one of those that penned a gospel that recounted the life of Christ. The truth is that God gave a, 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 a very... <laughs> Only four guys got this opportunity. Understand. Uh, he was put on this in this position to recount the life of Christ and the book of Mark, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, second uh, in the New Testament, is written by the guy who rejected and left the ministry, who Paul wanted to not be a part and caused a separation between uh, these great missionaries. What made the difference between Demas and Mark is Mark said, I'm not going to be defined by my mistake. I'm going to get up above my mistake and I'm going to march forward for Christ. When we see this statement, we the people, I want to point out to you, all of us make mistakes. Some of us are better at them than other of us. The truth of the matter is, it don't matter because we're all part of God's family. God's got a purpose for each one of us. And instead of us getting frustrated and say, oh, I messed up. I'm, I must not. I don't count for God. He still sent his son to die for you. You still count. You still matter. God still wants to use you. Let him. Let him. Do you know who stops God from using a Christian? Christian. Thank God. Did you know that God, the, the best that God has to use is human beings to do his work? I mean, that's the best he's got to work with. And we've all been hanging around human beings all our life, except during the COVID era. We've been hanging around human beings all our life. What have we found out about human beings? They have bumps and bruises and warts. Problems, difficulties, situations. All of us do. And the truth is that we need to realize what made the difference between Demas and Mark. Three things and I'm done. Number one, Mark fought. He fought. Keep trying to do what's right. He messed up, but he kept trying. Do you know after he left, he didn't really leave, leave. He probably went back home, sounds like. When Barnabas and Paul came back home, Mark 
probably approached his, uh, Barnabas said, I I'd like to go again with you guys. Give me a chance. So he was still trying to get it right. I messed up last time. I want to try to make it right. Keep on trying to do what's right. Listen, we as Christians need to realize, yes, we will mess up. It's human nature. But the Bible says, if we confess our sin, he's faithful. He is faithful and just to forgive us. If we'll confess our sin, we got to do our part. I want to try to get it right. But I keep messing up, Brother Dusty. What do I keep doing? Keep going to him. His mercies are renewed every morning, the Bible says. Let's keep going to him. I messed up yesterday. Well, do confess it. Try to get it right and do better tomorrow. Well, what about if I mess up a week from now? Don't worry about a week from now. Don't worry about tomorrow. Worry about today. You only got today to worry about. Do you know what? 24 hours is not really long. I mean, it used to be as a kid, like, man, I'll never get here when school was in. School had to be 17 hours long. It had to be. Because when I got dropped off and when I got picked up, it was long. Or when I walked to the, to, to the house or, and I got up before the sun came up, felt like I got home after the sun went down and come up again. I hated school. I'm still not too keen on school. Uh, the, uh, the, 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 I hated it. Uh, but but we, we've got to realize that, that God's got a plan for us and we need to keep on fighting, keep on plugging, keep on doing what's right. Secondly, not only should we fight, not only did he fight, he stayed focused. He was focused. He was focused on what? Doing something for God. I'm going to do something for God. I tried this, didn't work. I'm going to try something else. I tried this, it didn't work. I'm going to try something else. I tried this, it didn't work. I'm going to try it again. Uh, the truth of the matter is we're, we're, we're a society filled with instant gratification and we want it right away. But stop and think we got lights lighting up our building today because a guy decided I'm not going to quit. And over 3,000 times he found he failed. And they asked him, you failed all this time. What did you learn from this? And Edison said, I learned a number of ways not to make a light bulb. He say, well, that's just a silly statement. No, that's a statement of a guy that he, I'm going to figure this thing out one way or another. He fought, number one. Number two, he stayed focused. And number three, he had the faith. He had the faith. Faith in what, God? God's got this thing. Man, it don't look good. Yesterday didn't look good. Today it's not looking real good. I don't know about tomorrow, but I'm going to trust in the one that does know about tomorrow. And the truth of the matter is that Mark can teach us so much. So when you hear Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you turn, uh, hear somebody say, turn to the book of Mark. Remember the author of that gospel was none other than a guy that had messed up Paul and Barnabas was none other than a guy, probably the one that Jesus was being carried into being arrested. And he was there and could have at least spoken up and said he runs away naked in fear. That's the guy we're talking about. That God used like this. And you think God can't use you? Truth is, he wants to. But he cannot unless you're willing. That free will... <laughs> It is a blessing and a curse. I don't know if you figured that out. It's a blessing and a curse. It's a blessing because we can choose to love what we want to love. It's a curse because we can choose to do what we want to do. And sometimes the what we want to do doesn't correlate with what God wants us to do. So it's a challenge, a job, the work. That's why we encourage you to learn memory verses. That's why we encourage you to read the Bible. Why? So we can stay focused on what God wants us to do. Our Heavenly Father. A few thoughts from, I think, a great man in the Bible that I'm, I'm afraid is often overlooked. We'll say Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in our list of the Gospels. We don't realize that you took a guy that was an outcast and messed up. We even caused the divide of the greatest tandem of missionaries ever. And yet you used him in a mighty way. Paul said he was profitable huh, for the ministry. Peter loved him and used him and influenced him greatly. But amidst all that, you used him to sit down and pen the very gospel of Mark for us to have record of Jesus. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to realize we have value and you have plans for us. Help us to let you work that plan. With our heads bowed and eyes closed.